Today, our session will be led by Don Barry, Principal Consultant at Asset Acumen Consulting. But Don? Thank you, uh, June. All right, so hopefully you can see this uh, uh, PowerPoint. I'm just gonna move the display screen up a little bit out of the way. Uh, so this got titled Preparing for Reliability uh, in an IoT-enabled asset management world, uh, really to um, address, if you like, and attract the folks that are concerned about technology and where technology is going, and also particularly the folks that might be uh, reliability-type folks. Uh, I suspect that we have a number of different people on this call uh, from different levels of experience, either in reliability or IoT or, or strategy and asset management. Uh, and, and so I hope this uh, is of interest. And, and my intent really was to uh, be in a position where we provoke thought and so uh, and, and uh, help you get a sense from some of the things that maybe you, you might want to think of as you're trying to prepare both yourself in terms of your overall asset management experience and specifically around reliability. But also, how do you get your IT folks to help you? Where are they going? And often what I've learned over the years is that they can be a little bit disjointed. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on my background. I suspect some of you might know who I am, some of them may not. I spent over 40 years at IBM. Uh, I ran the Canadian practice for asset management for about 16 years. I, I was the global center of competency lead for about three years for uh, IBM service group in, in asset management. Uh, I am a reliability center maintenance to practitioner with Aladon was at IBM and am again now uh, with this new uh, organization. And um, I teach at the University of Toronto and have been teaching at the University of Toronto for about 16, 17 years. In fact, there's another course coming up in November. And the main textbook that we use in that course you're seeing in this picture here, Asset uh, Management Excellence, for those who might be interested. Uh, the number of courses that we've evolved to teach in the University of Toronto program in physical asset management. Uh, there's a short course for asset management leading practices typically used when we try to help clients uh, figure out what they want to do, uh, basically calibrate discussions so we can figure out what they want to do as a prioritized uh, set of actions going forward. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've been helping municipalities sort out with what they may want to go focus on. Uh, RCM Reliability Center Maintenance 2. There's also Reliability Center Maintenance 3 that uh, folks could get themselves tagged to, but I'm formally lined up with RCM 2 just now. Um, with the university, we've also have a maintenance parts excellence program that uh, uh, we basically expanded after I left IBM, which was about two years ago. And, uh, and I have actually penned a book, but we haven't finished getting it edited, so it's not published yet, but we have a book out on that to support that. I've had clients help ask about data insights uh, on asset hierarchy structures and KPI development and things like that. So there's a lot of things that we've covered today. Actually, it's not any one of those topics per se, but it's maybe a subset of some of the things that I've talked about before in the physical asset management program. So the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about today is just what are the trends in IT, OT and IoT um, and, and, uh, and how's that disrupting this notion of leading practice in asset management? Uh, we're going to try and uh, how do we derive value decisions from insights, information, and data? Uh, what is the journey to automate an asset centric data supply chain, particularly reliability and IoT? And I'm not going to lay out the whole journey, but certainly going to talk about what I think some of the uh, perhaps primary disconnects can be because a reliability person will look at data differently than a data scientist, for instance. Uh, the chasm, the, the, the delta, if you like, the, the gap between uh, where you might be today and where most organizations want to be. Uh, what's the art of the possible? Uh, there's a continuum on that and, and where are you and, and where are you going and, and, and where's the gap? And I had a point of view of that at IBM, which uh, I've also used at the university and I'll, I'll share that uh, today. Uh, leveraging where data value happens. Uh, that's really, at the end of the day, data has, has a, is a big part of what has to happen to, to be successful. Uh, asset lifecycle data challenges, talk about that briefly. Example of data dynamics, uh, particularly if you want to leverage artificial intelligence type things. And once we've kind of, you know, I guess, injected all those different thoughts, uh, maybe it's time for you to go away and say, well, what's next for my organization? What's next for most organizations? And I thought I would just talk with perhaps the reality we all know, but maybe a lot of people have uh, not recognized immediately, hopefully you have, 
but there's a lot of technology out there. I mean, uh, I'm going to point to the screen here and look at my phone, but uh, digital technologies around consumer technology, operational advances are happening. A lot of IT uh, and, and operational technology um, uh, convergence. And then there's industrial technology. There's a lot of different things going on. So what do I mean by that? And also, how does IoT play? Well, IoT in a simple definition is just the, the fact that we have the internet uh, and the internet of things. Uh, it's all about, uh, well, again, the phone, uh, it could be sensors, it could be, uh, uh, you know, Alexa, it could be Google, it could be all those kinds of things. Now we're getting familiar with the notion that we can talk to something and it'll recognize the request and actually uh, give us uh, at least a high level answer. But how do we take all that data or how should we take all that data from an asset management perspective and who's been doing what or, or to what level have we been seeing it? Now I'm sure an awful lot of what I'm gonna talk about is, uh, are, is and are things that organizations have done and perhaps have gone further than what I'm gonna talk about. But the notion is that I would say virtually every organization is just scratching the surface of this and we're really not very far along at all. Uh, there, uh, from a four types of technology perspective, uh, we talked about the four types already. Uh, these are disruptive forces, uh, powerful global forces, the things that we don't control. If I have a, maybe the largest nuclear plant in the world, well, I don't control all the different things that are going on around me. I can maybe have a little influence on what's going on in my plant. That's about it. Uh, and because of all these things that are going on, there's emerging consequences in, in terms of how things are disruptive, in terms of even how your employees expect to see data. All those things change. Uh, uh, we're, we're getting a bunch of data scientists looking at data and they're looking at the data, trying to make decisions out of it. Whereas I would say reliability people uh, might more or less say, what are the decisions I wanna make? And, and therefore, what, what data, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, and, then, and then what's the pressing challenge? Well, each one of us need to stay competitive. Uh, these influences must be acknowledged both in the near term, and assuming there's, a, there's a, a longer term. So what does that happen? Well, in the industrial side, side of technology, there's particular in the, uh, or specific rather to the utility industry, which I've had a bit of a focus on both when I left IBM and since, uh, there's obviously nuclear and, 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 and uh, thermal and, and hydro, but also solar and storage and micro operations and wind and fuel cells, those kinds of things. Operation technology, there's smart grids and, and automated demand response and, and situational awareness type things, which again, can be you know leveraging data off of our phone, if you like, or sensors. Uh, there's consumer technology, um, which talk about different applications and social networks and things like that. And then probably the one that applies to us more directly and specifically, and, and what I want to expand on a little more is the digital technology, the internet of things, the, the, the data, the big data, the cloud, the analytics, uh, the cognitive things, the mobile things. And as we look at that, um, you can look at what's in the, in the internet of things, we can look at what's situational awareness, you can look at big data and cloud and, and artificial intelligence. But probably the other thing is all of these things are influencing the fact that we can bring technology and operations um, um, operate operations technology together so it and ot together um, and and uh, and and they're undergoing stru structural transformation and that's really this notion about how do we get reliability and iot to work together so that's one set of thoughts i wanted to share with you there was a study that came out just about the time that I had uh, retired from IBM, just a few months before, and I didn't actually see this report till after I'd left IBM. But it's interesting to recognize in a survey that IBM published publicly uh, over you know, 6,000 uh, CXOs, and there's quite a mix of companies, uh, virtually uh, uh, at least half of them were half a billion dollar companies or larger. Um, they started to see and, and, and were able to distinguish between companies that are leading versus companies that are lagging. And so they would say the outperformers are leading and, and, the, and the others are lagging, if you like. And when you look at the leading ones, 92% of outperformers leverage internal and external data. So the leading ones are actually getting a handle on data and doing something with it. The outperformers are focusing on quality control, production operations and machine maintenance kind of things. Well, that's the piece that tweaked me on this particular report and kind of went, okay, machine maintenance, if they're focusing on that, that's helpful for me from an asset management perspective and also so as aftermarket repair services for the likes of a, of a manufacturer like a Bombardier or whatever, who not only manufactures the product, but also has to maintain it. 
so I thought that was interesting is that we're seeing that the, the leaders are in fact um, pursuing the data. The L performers, almost 90% of them also have required data skills in house um, versus the lags, but they're also looking for more. They want more data visualization, advanced data analytics and analysis, if you like, and advanced mathematical modeling. And again, I think that's helpful to know, but also be cautious because this is something I experienced uh, both in my life with IBM and prior and, and since that just because people are touching and playing with this stuff doesn't mean it's propagated across the industry. In fact, quite the opposite. These are usually skunk works operations where they tried it in a few places and are still trying to uh, curate the data, curate the decisions so they can get to a point where they're going to automate. And that's kind of the notion that I think um, I want to set an expectation for virtually everybody who's who's looking at this data and how that might work for them. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, let's go back to fundamentals. The traditional value of asset management arguably is that big arrow across the top. It's a supply chain. You have this notion of a customer on the on the right that you're servicing. You have perhaps a bunch of assets that we bought for the purpose of, of providing value and making money, and and for potentially this process as a supplier. And maintenance has a role to make sure these assets are you know, going to be available and, and, and uh, perhaps the overall equipment effectiveness type metrics of, of availability and uh, throughput and um, uh, brain cramp on the third one for the, for the OEE. So availability, throughput and quality, there you go, the output. And, and arguably if you can use all the hours in, in a year, that might be a fourth metric. But so you look at these these OEE things and, and say overall equipment effectiveness things and say, well, that's what maintenance is going to try and provide and keep these assets running. Uh, parts has a role to play to keep maintenance afloat, if you like, to have the part when it's needed, when maintenance needs the part and somehow find a way to predict when that part is needed. Procurement has a role to get the parts for, uh, for, um, as, as, as uh, either maintenance or parts requires it and somebody's got to pay the bills. So you have some of those kind of fundamental requirements in a business process. And as you work through that, um, some of the things that become obvious is that the operational data for most operating systems come from a different system than the system you might be running to do your maintenance. Uh, even some of the big ERPs, even though some of that data might exist, people haven't quite found a way to bring those two things together or they're still working on that. So there's, there's often a gap there. So most operations and asset management systems don't have the ability to blend the data well. And that's important if you want effective KPIs uh, or responsive asset management. And, and, be, and, and why do I need good KPIs and responsive asset management? It's really to get the people uh, to be empowered, if you like, to, to actually do the right things and react the right way to bring value from those assets. So with that in place, what does that mean? Well, it means every one of those assets uh, that's trying to drive that value is probably a subset of a number of different processes. Here we got receiving and process one, two, three, four, and eventually you're going to distribute it out. Every one of those could be a series of assets that arguably you need to analyze and understand is that a is that a bottleneck in my process? What's the right reliability of those assets? How does that contribute to my overall supply chain? And and does that create some sort of um, constraint? as I try and understand the process of me, me being able to supply value and bring value in my supply chain. So that's arguably really what asset management is about. We bought assets so we can bring value in our supply chain. Some other fundamental truths is because most systems don't blend data well together, it's difficult to do KPIs. I kind of already said that. It's also difficult to have responsive asset management because we don't blend KPIs. But also, we haven't necessarily sorted out our KPIs in a way that we understand what are the proper KPIs at the executive level versus what are the proper KPIs at middle management or, or perhaps a supervisory level. What, what are the KPIs for the craft of the supervisor? And there should be even KPIs for the asset itself. So how do we, how do we d discern those things and decide what the KPIs ought to be? In a lot of organizations, I've seen a lot of passion where people get together and kind of um, <laughs> noodle through what the KPIs are and then hold on to theirs with, with, with great tree hugging capability and passion as to why it's important. Well, for in your role, if you're functional, that's important. At executive level, the roles, the, the, the measurement might, might be different. And to try and get people to understand that there's actually quite a matrix of data that needs to be understood 
to drive success. And there's a lot of arguments around uh, how the KPI stuff can and should work. And it's really uh, notionally about getting the people together and just sorting that out. What are our pain points? How do we do that? What's the right metric? Those kinds of things. Another uh, fundamental truth is the fact that when, you, when you're actually doing reliability center maintenance work, uh, probably 89% of the components of, of a particular key asset fail randomly over time. And, and only 11% of the components fail over time or over a period of usage. So often we'll walk into an organization, they're doing 40, 50, 60% PMs, and arguably that may be right, but it may not be right. Uh, because if only 11% of components fail over time, why do you have so much time-based maintenance? And if I'm going to have, if I'm going to try and address the things that fail randomly over time, which is often 89% of the components, how do I get an early handle on that? And I would argue that's a little bit of the rub in terms of where some of the RC, the reliability center maintenance type approach and, and where um, IoT can help. Because if 89% of the components fail randomly, then Arguably, I need to get some sort of early indication of failure. Uh, so if I have a pump, the pump is uh, the, the, the um, uh, pump is supposed to pump 300 liters a minute, but the actual bearing on the pump is starting to fail. I might start to get a bit of vibration. Uh, in fact, I'll never use this. There's my pump. I might start to get a little bit of vibration, uh, but eventually, uh, if, if it's not addressed, then perhaps it starts to heat up and eventually I get some noise and then I get what we call a fully filled state. So there's gonna be some early indications of failure that could possibly happen. And if that's the case, how often do I want to send somebody to go and inspect that? Uh, if I know that first indication of failure of the pump to fully filled state might be three months, maybe I send somebody monthly. Then you also have the reliability argument that says, well, if I send somebody every day, maybe statistically I could be reduce risk and therefore more, be more reliable, but sending somebody every day comes at a cost. And so that's, I think, where IoT can fit, if it makes sense. Can I put in a sensor to sense one of those early indications of failure? Now, unfortunately, in this presentation, we're not gonna have the time to go through that in great detail. That wasn't the intent. This is more to talk more about technology. But the notion is to understand where all that would fit and, and how could I offset that? If I put a sensor in there, I can now turn say, well, yeah, I could check it every day. I could check it every hour. I could check it every minute. Now I have a bunch of data I need to somehow deal with, uh, interpret, um, curate, if you like, and, and, and park uh, until such time as it, it's a threshold that makes any difference to my business. So if I look at this overall traditional value of asset management, you say to yourself, okay, if I have the asset, Ideally, most organizations have what they call enterprise asset management system. Primarily an enterprise asset management system is the transaction data, the asset hierarchies that you put the transaction data against. It might manage the parts, it might manage the, a little bit of the procurement, it might manage some of the health indicators. Um, and some of the new EAM solutions are starting to do that. But it's not really telling you what maintenance to do. It's not really telling you whether I should be doing PMs, if I'm doing PMs, how often. It shouldn't, it's not telling me what predictive maintenance I should do and, and, and how often. And so the whole notion of coming to a reliability-centered approach is to pick the effective thing that I could put into this thing called the EAM solution to drive efficiencies um, or, or, or to execute that efficiently, if you like. That's probably a better way to describe that. So RCM proactively mitigates the consequence of failure. And if I have that proactive understanding, uh, once I've de decided that's what we're going to do, how do I execute that efficiently? So that becomes kind of the mindset. Just for those who may not be aware of RCM, uh, part of that definition is a process used to determine what must be done, including maintenance, engineering, operations, and, and other management type policies. So it could be any of those things that impact the, uh, uh, the success of that particular process or IE asset to ensure that the assets continue to, to fulfill their functions in their full, um, current operating context. And so when you look at that, what do you basically do? Well, you, you try to get a group of people to understand and document the asset, the operating context. Why do I have this asset? Well, I need 300 liters a minute. What's this failed state? Well, the, the, the bearing seized. Uh, what's the cause? It could be a whole lot of things you could do for failure, failure modes effects analysis and causal analysis. And then what's the, what's the mitigating tactic, the consequence and the prescribed task? So those are some of the things you go through in, in simple, oversimplified uh, terms in terms of how you might uh, 
document the risk and reliability. The, the, the true data points uh, for RCM are things like asset, operating context, function, failed state, failure mode, failure effect, inherent risk, consequence, mitigating tactic, frequency. All those things are needed to, to decide uh, you know, what kind of work order would I use to mitigate this? Uh, it should be pre preventive, predictive, corrective, those kinds of things. Inspection and, and what the frequency ought to be. So those are the kinds of things that you need to do. You can also look at it and say, well, you know, if, if I'm looking at it and there's a high probability that I could have a pretty serious risk, what are some combined actions that I could do to turn it from orange to yellow and yellow to green in terms of a risk versus probability kind of scenario? And as you look at these notions of things that um, give me early indication of failure against those 89% components that are in fact likely going to happen in a random way, rather than, than send somebody out there to inspect uh, weekly or daily, um, is there something I can do to automate this? And hence, that's the notion of perhaps we can bring in some sort of IoT solution or some sort of sensor that can bring in and take that data. It's, it, and believe me, this is going to be complex, um, but um, and and try and um, make some sense of that to to a degree that in fact would take that data, hit a threshold, and automatically generate a work order. Just checking my time here. Okay. So when you look at systems at a high level. Um, it struck me that an awful lot of work is spent, maybe not in my, my background where, for instance, at IBM, we spend an awful lot of time implementing EAM solutions, uh, but there's obviously asset management strategy that has to happen from an asset lifecycle perspective. Design engineering has a role to play early in the asset lifecycle. Uh, someone actually has to manage the assets throughout the lifecycle. Asset um, investment planning has to happen and some analytics against that. And eventually you have to decide, how am I going to disposition this asset? That, so that's almost one stream. And this is a highly oversimplified stream, but just to give you some senses of what's in it. When you get to the actual kinds of things that might be in an EAM solution, again, strategy plays, KPIs play, uh, maintenance execution, which is maintenance planning and scheduling, maintenance parts, uh, some sort of enhanced asset management systems to, to, to uh, complement all of this data, give you perhaps, again, some uh, procurement things, uh, some uh, asset health things, those kinds of things, and ultimately to drive a culture where your folks who are trying to execute the maintenance feel that they're uh, working well with operations, so total productive maintenance can play along with uh, uh, making sure they're trained and, and managing training and skills and those kinds of things. When we go up the ladder a little bit more, I would suggest that obviously RCM can play anywhere, reliability center maintenance can play anywhere, but it, it certainly plays at trying to address that 89%. And, and, and if we're going to address the 89%, then sensors can play and IoT tools can play. And therefore we can start to, to do some analysis on a lot of data, including the sensor data and do some predictive analytics type things. And asset performance management type tools can play there as well. But ultimately uh, to get any of that done, it, this is a huge change exercise. Um, and generally speaking with maintenance, who by definition were problem solving cynics, uh, I would argue that 60% uh, of the exercise is gonna involve people, 25% of the process and exercise is gonna involve process, and 15% is gonna involve these technology type things. Um, also arguably, because we're dealing with assets right from cradle to grave, uh, right through the asset life cycle, this notion of a chief, chief asset officer makes sense to have something applied at that role. As we continue on, well, why do we exist? We exist, these assets exist because we in fact want to bring value to our supply chain. So there could be other data types, external operation influences such as weather or market or those kinds of things that could be playing in there. Uh, if we have those things as well as all the constraints in asset management, we can have operational prescriptive constraints and give us that kind of insight. We can have supply chain planning uh, advanced planning, if you like, which is really the, the, the process planning inside a plant, and we could have supply chain optimization, which is the whole supply chain. Um, now, there's many other definitions, and what one could organize it different ways, but that's how I like to organize it for the sake of this discussion. And one piece that I think often gets forgotten, and that is, let's not forget, folks, that we're doing this because somebody bought an asset and we're trying to make a profit, we're trying to make money, uh, we're trying to make money in a way that uh, um, we produce value and we don't hurt anybody. So no, no health safety issues and no environmental impacts. 
and and hopefully we're good corporate citizens in the environment, those kinds of things. So finance has a role to play here to make sure that we we're going to keep even our shareholders happy as we do all these things. As you look at those different components, arguably the the next thing to say is, well, what things could require systems? Well, an awful lot of those would require systems if you look at it. Uh, virtually, strategy on its own probably doesn't need systems. Uh, virtually every other category does. Total productive maintenance, which primarily is getting people together. Uh, perhaps maybe I don't need systems for that, but tracking what we did and, and getting people trained and tracking the training could require systems. Asset disposal is mechanical and, and perhaps marketing of the disposal that disposed asset, keeping track of those things. And even RCM for the most part, reliably center maintenance, is getting people together and deciding what it is we're going to do, and we'll talk a little bit about that and talk about the, the asset um, operating context and, and uh, its function, functional failure, failed, uh, failed state, if you like, the failure mode effects analysis and those kinds of things. That's generally, generally somebody putting that together, but then we're going to log that into a system where, where all of these data systems can, can, can use that information and, 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 and take advantage of it either through structured or unstructured data sets. Now, to step back a little bit more, if you wanted to look at this from a Gartner perspective in 2015, they published this notion that there's asset enterprise asset management solutions, there's asset performance management solutions, and there's asset investment planning solutions. And I clearly made this a little more complex than saying it's just this, but um, I wanted to reckon, or, or acknowledge the fact that, you know, Gartner certainly would have said perhaps five years ago that these are the systems that uh, are, are primarily playing out there when you go out and try and buy a COP. Type solution. Now, what occurred to me though is when I when I look at an awful lot of these organizations and say, well, where are you and where do you want to be? Um, if you look at um, where you you are, many organizations may say, well, I have an enterprise asset management system. For instance, when I was at IBM, that might have been maximal. Uh, I have automated planning and scheduling. I have some key asset prioritized. I have integrated parts management, I have KPIs, I have some reliability activity data, although I have to admit there's not, there's many people that don't do this. They talk about it. They don't actually understand the formal declarations of a reliability center maintenance kind of discipline, but they might think they have it. Um, new asset data, they have limited data mining, they have some field support and some operations alignment. And you say, okay, well, that's where you are now, if you're there. And I, as I said, I've taught, I've shown this chart publicly before and say, well, how many people think they have all those things? And probably not a lot of hands go up. Where do you want to be? Well, I want to be more integrated against the EAM, the APM, the, the, the AIP. I want to have um, optimized operations scheduling. So I want to take that data and line it up with what, what operations is trying to do. I want to have full reliability rules leveraged in the asset management prioritization. So I want to be able to take those things and understand the, the, the guidelines, the thresholds, and be able to make some decisions on that, maybe even make automated decisions. I want to optimize maintenance operations, or sorry, I want to optimize operations and maintenance, rather KPIs, get those lined up. IoT here has a, a role to play because it's going to connect everything. And if I have all that, then maybe I can get to the point where I can do some artificial intelligence and cognitive data analytics. Um, maybe I can leverage IT to, to be a leading field support if I happen to have a field support. And this this list goes on, and it's not a, the, the list is certainly not stopped at these, you know, maybe five or you know, eight bullet points. Uh, dynamic asset constraints. I understand what the constraints are if I'm going to go make commitments to my client uh, that I can deliver. And so virtually every organization kind of has here's where we are on the left, and here's that nice green piece of grass over there. How do I get over there? And I would argue even this list on the right doesn't describe the full list of things that I had covered, you know, two charts prior. So there's more and more things that one can look at. Another way to look at this, and this has kind of always been my frustration, it was my frustration for quite a while, you go to conferences, and, and uh, especially ones that are promoting asset management software, and you'd say, uh, hey guys, uh, uh, you know what? You know how many people in this conference are are maintenance people, and there might be twenty percent of the people put their hand up. How many people are you know other categories? When I get to IT, there might be fifty or sixty percent are IT people, and so what typically I notice is a lot of people come in, they look at their current software, whatever they're doing, look at the new enhancements, come back and say, I brought this back to my company. Aren't we good? Let's go for a soda. 
Um, the reality is that it's it's really about the more holistic. How do we drive value at the at, at the bigger picture? If all we are doing is trying to put a few more enhancements, you know, on on the enterprise asset management system, then we're primarily just focused on helping the, our our own company become more efficient. Now that's not bad. Depends where you are in your in your overall maturity, but the reality is there's a lot more to be had. If you're trying to help them pick the right maintenance, which is where reliability type things happen, it's also take that data and have some connectivity to it. Uh, along with automated sensors and expert systems and IoT connectivity, that's where you're trying to do the effective thing and drive it through the, the efficiency. And if we can take all that data and actually drive things in such a way that we're actually going to share this information with the, with the production systems and make some prescriptive type decisions from that, then there's even more things that we can do. We can go from uh, reliability and automated sensors to cognitive insights, predictive to operations prescriptive to, to supply chain optimization, which by the way, that's why we have the asset in the first place. We're here to drive value. Now for almost two decades, we've been helping clients, you know, fundamental clients say, well, what's your percent plan? You know, well, if you can go from 40% plan to 60% plan, 80% plan, so 60% plan, 80% plan might save you 20% of your maintenance budget. We're not really in the maintenance budget business. We're in the asset productivity business. We're in the go-to-market business. And so um, if you think about that's traditionally what people have been doing because we've been so much myopically looking at the enterprise asset management type processes. If we had a data set such as this and we had the full commitment from IT to support us on these kind of data sets and our asset management group was, was mature enough to deliver it, then we could change our argument to well, what's our planned process to predictive? How do we go from focusing on percent plan to percent predictive? How do we drive that? That will really up the game and drive our business. And, and with that, we'll, we'll have better asset work in asset management, uh, better optimized assets. Uh, we'll be more of a pre prescriptive asset management organization or prescriptive operations management, and we'll be integrated right to our supply chain. So a lot more things to think about coming back. If I'm a data scientist, the average data scientist says, hey, you know, you guys are data rich. You don't know what the data is going to tell you. Give me all that data. I'll help you make some decisions. You're going to save a lot of money. And, and I don't want to demean that argument. There's, there's uh, nothing inaccurate about that argument. It's just a little frustrating for perhaps in my case, a reliability guy who might say, well, I already know the answer to those arguments. I don't need the data to tell you. But here's what the, the average data scientist will look at something and say, what data do I have available? What information can I get from that data? What insights can I get from that data? And what decisions can I make from that data? And again, nothing wrong with that. The average reliability guy will say, wait a sec, what decisions do I have to make to go drive value uh, you know, to the business? What insights do I need to make those decisions? What information do I need to get those insights? And what data do I need to, to, to get those insights or to get that information? And so when you look at those things, this is cyclical. I mean, all these things have to happen all the time. Not one or the other works necessarily by itself. Certainly if you embrace the vision that you're going to embrace data and systems and analytics so we can have an optimized supply chain. We're not just there to drive benefits uh, for um, a unique asset management perspective or portion of the business. So that's another way to look at this. Okay, so obviously there's a lot of data dependencies. I'm not gonna go through trying to explain all these. The point I'm trying to make is we gotta get the data elements right, understand uh, the, the interrelated data dependencies. We gotta confirm the source of the data and the quantity of the data, the quality of the data rather, uh, get comfortable with the decisions that are made. So we've got to curate this stuff and we gotta practice and confirm and challenge the data sets. Uh, build the process execution into the system to automate process triggers, alerts and steps and drive value. Uh, from and, and from and for the, the data dynamics. Going back to uh, an IBM argument in that earlier report, uh, you really gotta take control. That's really what I wanna say here is take control of where that value happens with the data and and, and we need to do it in a secure and efficient way. And, and that's one of the things I never had to worry about when I was with IBM, there was lots of folks that, that seemed to know how to do that. Once you have that data, you have, have to convert it into information and a good example of that is this elevator shaft. If, if I have the sensors on the elevator uh, in, in a very simplified analytics perspective, I can help to monitor usage, I can flag issues, I can find patterns that predict. And I would argue that's a very, very simplified argument. 
similarly, you can take control of where data happens. Um, if you have new value, a new values captured or created at the operational age where people and assets in the enterprise live, so you understand where the people and, and all those things happen, uh, maybe we can draw out some of that information and change how the value props are experienced. So again, I would say ideally that might be the data scientist approach, but with a reliability background, you can bring that home. And new devices on the factory floor to advise operators when intervention is needed, somehow alert them. You know, uh, could be a, a screen in, in, in the workroom, could be a phone uh, in a larger plant, those kinds of things. But this notion of IT and OT convergence with a focus on production schedules and overall equipment effectiveness. Again, to change the, the directional, but again, if we're looking at asset lifecycle, I said I would talk about that briefly, and so I'm going to do that here. Um, I had a client that really had a very difficult time getting the information from, say, a new design in a utility to um, what the actual folks that were going to maintain the utility uh, were going to happen. When do they get the data? When do they actually sign off on it through commissioning? Um, what are the full roles? So there's often at least in a couple of clients I've walked in a disconnect in terms of um, this information and how much of this information needed to be shared, in particular maintenance approach or the parts strategies. Uh, and then how do we actually formalize ownership? Do we own it? Do we take over? Does maintenance and operations take over uh, after commissioning? Uh, or does design engineering still own it all through the asset life cycle? Those are some things that uh, one needs to fuss with as you go through some of these arguments. Because one of the arguments there was a parts argument uh, in one client, we came to the notion that virtually everybody played a role. I mean, if you, it, it, it's like a marriage. If everybody doesn't work hard to make this marriage work, guess what? It's not going to be optimal. And so you need operations and maintenance in the vendor and procurement, design, engineering, and finance, and IT and legal and HR all to work if you expect maintenance parts to work. Recognizing that through the life cycle of the asset, and depending upon how many of that particular asset you have installed in a particular location, the usage of some of these parts could build up and eventually fall off. So there's an asset life cycle on that. And so when you look at some of those things from a pure data, and I'm, I'm gonna use an inventory example before I jump to the maintenance example, say, well, if I have the data, what can I do with the data before I can, you know, have less human involvement in that. So if all I understand is what part is out of stock for critical equipment, then maybe a human has to sit down and look at all that before we can make a decision in the green box and take an action. Uh, if if you say, well, I, I, I also know that it's a part I don't normally stock or I do stock, well, now a human has less activity he has to spend. Um, conditions that precede this critical demand, are they known or predictable? Could I have done some things? Well, I could have got in front of that perhaps with a bit of tooling and, and, and maybe the human had to spend a little less time, the analyst had to spend a little less time. Is the data available to predict the demand and prescribe the mitigating stock policy? Well, if that's the case, maybe I can even automate this decision to a point where the human just says, yeah, it says this, I agree. So we're now we're, I don't really have to get involved, I just make a decision in that uh, green tower. On the other hand, if I can accommodate the, and predict and execute the mitigation with the available data, maybe I can automate that decision. And there's nothing wrong with, say, we stop there. Perhaps I could even go to the point where we turn this into artificial intelligence or cognitive computing and generate new questions that say, what other conditions can help me predict the need and execute the mitigation with available dynamic data? I borrowed this, by the way. I, I saw uh, Mr. Bear present this in LinkedIn in one of his articles, and I thought, boy, that, that could help me. I'll, I'll change the words, obviously, but uh, I use the same approach. Using the same approach from uh, asset and production management, so even asset management, it's almost the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, it, an asset is functionally failing with a known failure mode. Well, okay, that's nice, but it failed. So what does the human have to do? Is the failure mode predictable and, and the effect understood? Okay, the human maybe has to do a little bit less. Are the conditions that predict this critical failure and this critical demand known and predictable? Hopefully the human has to do less. Uh, is the data available to predict the failure and prescribe mitigating solution tasks? Well, maybe I can get right to a point where it's going to make the decision and I just go yay or nay. And obviously, how do I automate that decision? What other data do I need to perhaps curate the data to make sure I can actually automate that decision? And then what other data can I take in? You know, I may be able to say, hey, in these weather conditions at this time of year, uh, in this market, and this demand for the business, I need to do some other things to mitigate risk in my business. So as you look through some of those charts, and presumably for those who might want to copy this, because I know a lot of those questions got copied, they're shown on the next chart. And the whole idea is, how do I take the human out of this and make it more um, automated? 
as you look through the whole asset life cycle, there are algorithms, and, and this is just examples. I could have plugged in more algorithms for every one of these cases. I could have plugged in a lot of the blanks. Uh, but just to give it, I mean, there's arguments and algorithms for virtually every step of the life cycle. And so uh, it's just a matter of sitting down saying, where are we? What are we trying to do? Where are we gonna plug this? And, and and this is really just to give you a sample concept that, you know, people have thought a lot of this through. Where are we gonna take it? Okay. Uh, again, another example, uh, not one that I worked on, this is actually a NASA example, um, that just talks about the notion of going from requirement variables all the way to prescribed action. And arguably, they they take failure criticality, the, the, the impact of the business if it fails, they look at PDF logic, the potential failed state to fully failed state, which is that 89% kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, failure rate that we talked about before. They have a number of algorithms that they can noodle through to sort out which ones they, they, they decide to use. Ultimately, depending upon all the different uh, available uh, influences, they can say, well, this is the best algorithm. So they select the algorithm and they can do that um, arguably in, a, in, a, in an automated way to decide what the outcomes are. Again, whether it's inspection, replacement, restoration, uh, you know, whether it's for a turnaround, those kinds of things. Another example, and this is uh, this is also one I, I, I was aware of, but didn't directly work on, uh, where they were trying to predict uh, what the next opportunities would be. This was not reliably based, almost pure data analyt analytics based, looking at previous history. So if you look at the equipment monitoring decision stuff, so you've got assets and reliability and work execution information, all basically the data you would get from your EAM. And you look at some of the other structured data, it could be equipment drawings and maintenance work orders, which would come from your EAM, SCADA data, historians, again, mostly structured data. You can look at unstructured data, which could be basically documents, um, um, OEM manuals, uh, OEM written things about reliability on, a, on that uh, uh, bearing, for instance, and just read through it. I wanna stop there and think about this. They actually have computers now, uh, looking at all the medical journals to try and mitigate cancer. Um, if I can read all the medical journals to sort out the, the options on cancer, the same arguments could be used for asset management. We just got to get to it. How do you execute these things? Well, you, you have data connectivity, you got to have streaming analytics, uh, document conversion, geospatial, depending upon if you're dealing with that, you know, the, the, the machines are self learning uh, in terms of, well, we decided this is true. If that's true, I can move on with this. Um, and of course, by the way, machine learning in my mind is still machine learning, but curated by a human. Uh, and then, you know, and now it's not no surprise to most that because if you've got a, an Alexa, uh, Alexa at home or a, a Google machine at home, you can talk to it. It will turn off the lights. It will do things for you. So speech to text, text to speech, tone analyzer, natural language classifiers, visual recognition, retrieve and rank, all those kinds of things, taking it through a process, which you know, isn't necessarily exactly this process, but it can take in, you know, the, the asset sensor connectivity and manage the data resources and build a corpus and, and so on to a point where you can actually make a decision. Now, I purposely mocked this up to show you the tools as opposed to the actual process, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, you know, the kinds of things that could be in there. This is not simple stuff. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty big investment, can be a pretty big investment, but, you know, for the, for the right organization, this can be uh, a very valuable, particularly if you're million, you know, losing millions of dollars in, in, in production you know, over a few minutes or moments. Um, just checking the time here, I guess we're okay. Um, what does success look like? Now, I think one of the folks on this call and I were involved in, in, in a strategy assessment. Again, I've changed this a little bit uh, to what the actual outcome was, so I'm not giving away any solutions. But uh, um, so this is really a representative outcome, but we talked to a, a large global company who had, um, let's we'll, we'll say they were in, in aggregate mining and of some sort. And uh, they had uh, a mine in a rather uh, uh, war-torn area of, of the world. And, and so they were trying to figure out how to improve the mine and what kind of IT tools they could put in place and how do they get to support that remotely? And what would the vision for that be? Uh, from their central site, as opposed to having to go to that war torn area. Um, and, and so they ultimately came up with this as a, as, as a kind of solution. It's not exactly, but it gives you the right ideas. There's some sort of predictive asset optimization, analytics automation, predictive modeling, self-service analytics, 
artificial intelligence type things, IoT real-time insights, digital twinning, which I actually haven't talked about, and, and supply chain optimization. So those are the kinds of things they came up with as an idea. As they noodled through this, and this was after two or three days of strategizing, they said, you know what, this is great, we can do that, but we actually have to support that. We have to support that with something. We have to make sure they know how to do planning and scheduling and, and they have the right KPIs. Um, they had the right uh, uh, reliability type information sorted out. They have a total productive maintenance culture. They, they understand what maintenance tactics to use and when, which is arguably part of the reliability argument, parts management, the life cycle management and asset performance management. And even then they went, well, okay, that's cool. We, yeah, we definitely need that. Maybe we're done. No, we need to even go deeper. We need to have some monitoring of that. We need to have some maintenance services of this. We need to have remote support and standards training, audit sites, be able to do that. I mean, digital twinning in this case down at that level was more like business twinning on a spreadsheet, but so not quite the, the analytics twinning, their process twinning up above. Um, health, safety, and environmental programs, asset investment planning. So all these things had to be done supported by a number of systems, including some sort of enterprise asset data management and leveraging the technologies from that part of the possible uh, graph that I showed you earlier. So we're almost done, but I have, I guess, one set of questions for you, and that is uh, that, you know, I don't expect you to answer now, but if you're an organization that simply, uh, don't know, oversimplify, but you're focusing on enterprise asset management, you're focusing on whatever components you're trying to focus on, you know, give yourself a bit of a health check. I got my finger on my wrist here. And, and, and maybe challenge yourself against all these questions. Just understand where you are. I think you might find it a bit humbling. Uh, the reality is we need to drive value. That's why we're here. Somebody bought these assets, they brought us in, we need to drive value. And if we focus too much on you know, the, the, the little pieces, we get too myopically focused on things. Sometimes we miss the forest for a tree. So I think we need to try and understand the bigger picture and understand how we can drive it. And, uh, and just challenge yourself on some of that stuff. To what degree is this true? Um, and with that, uh, I, I just do a little at audit here. And some of the talking points that uh, uh, Melanie and, and uh, June asked me to promise I would talk about emerging technologies, insights on fundamentals of assets, the role of IT and asset management structure versus unstructured, and some of the case studies. I think I've kind of talked about that at some level. And with that, I guess I'll ask if there's any questions. At this time, there aren't any um, questions in our Q&A panel, so I'm going to go ahead and close out the call. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you to our presenter today. As mentioned, we will share the recording of this call and respond to any questions that uh, you guys share via email uh, after this event. Please keep an eye out for an email from the ABLE1 team. Once again, thank you, everyone, for joining, and we hope you have a pleasant day.